Hey everyone, and welcome to episode 114 of the Solopreneur Grind podcast. I am happy to be joined by Ravi Ravindran. Ravi, thank you very much for coming on the show today. Hey, thanks for having me, Josh. I'm really excited, Ravi, because you know a thing or two about podcasts. So as, as you said, you don't often sit in the guest seat. I'm excited to, uh, to to have that opportunity with you. But can you give a little bit about, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself to get started? Who are you? What are you working on these days? Yeah. So uh, I like to joke like I'm a professional failure because uh, <laughs> all my success seems to come from failure. You know, I just happen to somehow fail forward. Um, so uh, I just, I'm just someone who just constantly likes to try new things. Uh, I've done three ventures when I was in my undergrad. That's what kind of really started my innovation career path. Each one of them were like successes of fail, uh, just successful failures in the sense that it just led to, uh, into more growth for me. And by the time I, my third one, which is my first tech company, uh, kind of collapsed, um, the university brought me in as a kind of an entrepreneur residence, which was insane. Like you fail at three things and they bring you <laughs> in to teach. Um, it never made sense to me, but somehow I, keep, I found myself in that opportunity and to help other entrepreneurs uh, blossom. And I really, and I like the opportunity of the fact that, you know, uh, how can I allow other people not to replicate my failures? You know, mm -hmm. like if, I, if anything, I can, I can provide that. Um, so I, I, I kind of, um, you know, fine tune that capability at the university level, start a podcast at the university to help startups, uh, because they were not getting enough attention, not enough media, uh, just as something that I can do for them kind of thing. And through that, uh, my, my current company has blossomed, um, startup number four, uh, Bluemax, uh, which is a performance management system for web 3.0 creators. Very cool. I'd, I'd love to hear a little bit more about the failures. And I think it's, it is extremely valuable, right? Because e even if the end outcome might not be fantastic, I mean, there, there's different definitions of success, right? And uh, even if it might not have been a commercial success, it can lead you to what's next. But can you take us to that first, we'll, we'll, you know, business or venture or whatever it was and, and tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I'll actually do a little bit one better. I'll flip back a little bit more. Um, I actually started my first venture in, in grade four. Um, started a lemonade stand, which is normal for most entrepreneurs. But what was a little abnormal is I tried to make a lemonade franchise. Uh, <laughs> I tried to sell kids in other neighborhoods to replicate my model. And uh, that was my first time I was like, you know, I, I couldn't get it out, get, get the ball rolling. And it pissed me off. Mm. Um, you know, so I was someone who always did something entrepreneurial, like growing up. So it, it, like, you know, my first company though, started at the age of 17. Um, so I was always like hanging out all, all the troublemakers, never a troublemaker myself, but like, just like a voyager to a voyager to that. So my parents always had this concern for me that, um, you know, on, like everything I did was just like associated with bad. Um, so there was a real concerted effort to make me into a doctor. You know, I was the first person in my family to go to university. Um, so they, they're like, you know, why don't you just go for it all? You know, being the typical brown tiger parents uh, environment that I grew up in. Uh, so I got convinced. I actually got sold on that, right? Um, and uh, went to my first year, uh, did my undergrad in neuroscience and psychology by the time I graduated. But in the first year, after my first year, 2008 happened, the financial crisis. And I literally saw people who graduated a year, two years, three years ahead of me, right? Uh, and I knew this because all my cousins were in university. I had older cousins in university. I knew their friends, things like that. And they were just lost their jobs and they came back of all places to, uh, to the university. So just like the 1930s, we had these like hobo lines, like soup kitchens. It was like that in the university level. It was like previous grads coming just hanging out because they had nothing to do. And I saw this and I, and I met with them and I'm like, I realized all the adults lied. All this talk of stability of jobs doesn't really exist. Like our markets and our environments can change at the drop of a hat. So right from that, uh, that moment, I'm like, I need to create my own opportunity. I need to fall back to my old ways of like, you know, selling CDs to pay for lunch, you know, um, a kind of, kind of mentality of like to hustle. So I started doing that in university. So the first company was really just a first corporation. Uh, under that, we were like a full services uh, um, solutions company, if you will. Mm -hmm. So all these people who you know lost their jobs, especially in Toronto, you know, uh, Canadian entrepreneurial spirit happened. There's, a, there's actually a boom in our economy after the recession because all the people went out and created startups and companies. Um, you know, um, oftentimes borrowing money to do that. So we became a solutions company helping other companies launch, right? mm -hmm. especially brick and mortar. So everything from like security cameras, alarm systems, getting contractors to build walls for you, the signage, um, flyers, marketing material. We became like a one-stop shop. 
just to set up these places, right? And uh, it was phenomenal how at age of 18, like I couldn't even have a bank account. My mom had to open it for me. We can get people who are 40, 50 trust us because they wanted that youthful energy um, to push them towards new heights because they're trying something new for themselves. Um, so that was really our stepping stone uh, to get started. How, how did you How did you start that? Like, how did you pick that one industry? And, and how did the first client come about? So keep in mind, like 2008, what I was doing uh, around this time was I was already having a consulting business on campus. So I never took OSAP or or or, or, or um, parents' money. To, I always paid my tuition every year myself in cash, and I did it as like a as a good thing for myself because I would make. I was one of the few who made money while on, in university because you have access to so many people. A lot of them who come from great backgrounds. Um, I, I was a guy who like you know through campus parties and you know made money there. Uh, I would help people with their applications to get OSAP and funding because I would know how the system worked, even though I never used it myself and, you know, charge a little, a little bit of capital there. Um, so I already had like this kind of uh, way of networking, figuring people out. So people started coming to me when they had ideas and somebody came to me and said, you know, I, uh, somebody hired, uh, is looking for four people to come and install security cameras uh, at this new store that was opening up. So uh, we're like, would you be down? Like, it's 50 bucks for an hour. I'm like, sure, you know, I can use, use some cash, right? Uh, um, some gas money. So we went down to do this, and I quickly realized that the person got paid se- like 1700 to install the cameras. They subcontracted to us some four, you know, uh, four kids to come and install one camera each for 50 bucks, mm-hmm. right? So I guess the job gets done really quickly. And then the actual unit itself, you know, um, cost like $600. So they were pocketing about $1,000. I'm like, why can't I do this? Mm-hmm. So the same guys in that room were like, you guys, this is replicated ourselves, right? So uh, right after that gig, we're like, we got together, started our first company down like at the end of the summer, but we made about like $30,000 in like the summer of 2008, um, just by all these new plazas that were opening up uh, all across Scarborough, with all these new, new businesses developing who needed stuff done. Um, so we started with cameras, went to point of sale systems, websites, and then we just contracted everything else out. And because we knew all these people in, on the university, it's cheap labor, right? It's like, hey, can you do a website? It's like, I know you can program. Okay, here, here's a gig for you. Uh, hey, can you get, uh, get this done for us? I'll give you a $50 cut, um, you know, uh, for getting this done for us. And it was just solutions engineering, right? So we just became this ultimate middleman for people starting companies. And we just found cheap university talent to fulfill it. Right. It's like a live in-person Fiverr kind of thing uh, That's exactly uh, long it. before it. Very cool. So, Ravi, what, what happened to that business? Like, what, why did it end? And what do you think was the key lesson that you then took to the next one? Uh, we just four guys who made too much money too fast. We <laughs> barely knew each other. Like, literally, we just came together for that one gig. And then we ended up getting married together by starting a company, right? Uh, that's something that a lot of people don't realize, especially starting a company is an intimate thing. Uh, it's like you're getting, you know, founders getting together. It's like that. So getting to know found, uh, you know, your, your, your marriage partners after is never always a great thing, especially when there's four, like three of them. And um, it fell apart because everyone wanted different things. They wanted to push a company in different directions. It literally became four companies operating under one legal umbrella, which was disastrous, right? There were contracts coming in, deposits were taken in for that were never signed or like, you know, processing. So risk of, the only reason we didn't get sued is because companies quickly realized we're underage and they're just like, okay, just don't, don't do this again. You know? <laughs> Just pay us back that deposit. So um, yeah, like uh, after a year or two, it became kind of almost uh, almost like a liability. Um, you know, almost got sued a few times. Like that was a true story. So so backed out of it, not because we weren't doing well. We didn't have the maturity to run that business, and that haunted me for quite a bit actually, because we were making quite a bit of uh, money. We we were easy to formalize setting, uh, formalize that process. We didn't have the right mentorship basically. Mm-hmm. So how does that lead to then the next venture? The next venture started because of that boredom. Like I dropped out of school during this time because I had so many, so much contracts. So my third year, uh, I think my no, the second half of my second year, I kind of dropped out because I, I'm like, yo, this is crazy. Like, uh, it, you know, like it just all this inbound stuff is happening, and like we just need to grow this and figure this out. So I dropped out, and then by 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 supposed third year, I'm back in school because. I uh, realized like, you know, uh, it, it wasn't scalable, it wasn't going to be fitting. So uh, I came back to school and was bored. So, um, you know, because I was paying for my tuition by cash every year, I realized like I can just do whatever the hell I wanted. So I took courses where I wanted. So I took a minor in economics, took a minor in political science. Just I was just 
at that time, I was just taking courses out of interest rather than caring about the degree and then seeing where that could lead me, meet the people I could meet, uh, became like talent pools that I can utilize for other things. Um, and, I was, and I was. And um, one of the things that came out of it was that realization that China was buying up all the metal. Scrap metal was a huge thing. So I uh, started a scrap metal recycling business <laughs> basically overnight. Um, at this time, this is like 2011, there was this huge labor crisis that happened, right? So after 2008, the financial crisis, uh, everything went up. All these people, uh, you know, like the economy crashed, people borrowed money, started companies, started businesses. There was like a minor crash that happened in 2011. And you see like these professional, con like, like welders, uh, framers, like people with, uh, with like, a trade background suddenly out of work. And it, in Toronto, they were working, they were taking like cash jobs, like $20 a day. They'll drive and do this and like, you know, like, like cash jobs, like 20 bucks a day, literally. And it was insane. So there are people with trucks, nothing to do. People with like forklift knowledge, nothing to do. So I just found these people again through university contacts. Cause like, oh, you know, my uncle's doing, going through this, going, you know, all these kind of things. My dad's talking about at his place, like this people being let go. So found all these people and literally got the contract by target that was opening up that year in Canada. It, you know, and then Walmart, I got a contract with them. Turns out these big box retailers, they, they, they have about each location can go through about 50 to 500 pounds of, uh, of, uh, scrap of metal from like racks, like that, that, that break and like equipment that doesn't, you know, gets returned. Walmart had this weird mandate that anything you return electronics and stuff like that, rather than checking quality, checking it, they destroy it. Hmm. So, so, uh, they had, a, they had a, this compliance thing where like they could not charge companies to get rid of material. It had to be a voluntary uh, thing. So, uh, whoever wanted a contract would do a voluntary donation to a Walmart charity. And then you would, you would, uh, you would win for that. And it was up to the each general manager of the store to assign that contract. Turns out, uh, a, a few of my friends, uh, a few people I've met in different pr people there, they knew th these general managers pretty well from either past work or the uncle, one person, and my first contract came because somebody was their dad was a general manager and they just connected me. Right. So, mm -hmm. um, I got assigned all these contracts, got these people to run these things. And I'll be literally, I remember being in the library, reading my neuroscience textbook, my computers opened up and I have all these GPS dots mm -hmm. on my trucks going and doing pickups. Um, and it was just like a pure cash play business. So how would it work? Is that a truck would go pull up into a Walmart or it will go up into like a, uh, into a contract we had a forklift will put the metal in and the truck would drive, uh, you know, go do a few pickups. And then, uh, but when it's full, go to a recycling center and the recycling center weighs the whole truck, right? Gives you a report on how much you weigh and you exit the, 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 the everything gets pulled out by for their forklifts. And then the uh, and the truck gets weighed at the end, mm -hmm. and and the metal is graded just by the guys in the back who use a magnet to touch different things, <laughs> different parts of the metal, and then depending on how strong the metal interaction is, it's a purity test. So based off of three touches and randomized touches, they put a purity test on how much per pound that metal is worth. So what I would buy, do is buy six packs for these guys, right? When we do the returns, make friends with them. Like we should go end of the day shift anyways. It's like, hey guys, you know, just got into this business, just want to get to know you, here you go. And just get to know them. So they do, I would have them by phone, text me. So when my guys go to drop them off, they would call and be like, hey, this will be unloaded for you. Just double check for me because a lot of people I use were contractors. And just by knowing that infrastructure, uh, you know, I could just, from the university, have an automated business running. Um, right. So each time the trucks left, it was like $900, $900, $900. And all I had to do was just coordinate those pickups and the schedule. So that talent mm. management, idea of just resourcing talent, I, it really came through university. Right. It, it's interesting. From, from the first two, it, it was as simple as, I mean, obviously a little bit more complicated than what I'm about to explain it as, but finding a core problem or demand and then sourcing people who can provide the solution and, and being the, the person in the middle, making sure it all flows well, right? Mm -hmm. um, especially maybe for people that are, you know, intimidated by that first type of business. I mean, if you can do that, it's, it's as, again, quote unquote, simple as that, right? But people don't have to think up some crazy models or pricing or tech solutions, right? Yeah. And I think that's one of the things I, I look back at. I'm like, oh my God, like I wish I had mentorship because <laughs> I had no idea at this time that even universities had incubators, accelerators, right? 
that goes to my next startup. That's when I discovered things. But like, so I had no notion of like, I wish like somebody just an adult just came in who just had, you know, me from like, you know, like at that point, 10, 15 years in the future would come back and be like, oh, listen, this is how you could scale this. This is how you can make this headache go away. Because there's this points that you've made these bad decisions that just lost a lot of capital or just like bled, you know, or, or like entered, led to a failed enterprise. So uh, in my 20s, like, you know, uh, I think there's a this quote like Jack Ma says, like, the best thing to go is to go and find great bosses. Uh, for mm -hmm. me, I just made myself that opportunity just like to learn, right? So I, I wasn't afraid of failing. I just tried different things. Uh, oftentimes, by dumb luck, it just kind of worked out. And it was just, I, I like to say, like, it's its uh, the infinite fight for uh, boredom. Most right. of the stuff is just because I thought it was interesting and fun to do. And it paid the bills. It helped me pay for university. Uh, so you just kind of roll together. Absolutely. And I'm, I'm sure what you learned was invaluable along the way. So what what happened with that business? And then and then let's go for number three as well, the third venture. Yeah, I mistakenly tried to scale it uh, in the wrong way. So rather than because there was all the other scrap metal companies coming up. So rather than trying to grow like vertically, sorry, horizontally and become like a large provider, what we realized is that a lot of these materials that we're, we're transporting were still valuable. Um, they, they could be utilized in other ways. So like, for example, uh, a water heater, like, you know, you recycle that, you, you recycle from the material value. But if you yourself take it apart and take the brass, like if you had like a factory floor and like, you know, you had a bunch of uh, people like sorting, if you just pre-sort the material, like you could actually make asymmetrically way, way more because like the base material is what the uh, what your cost you normally get is right like the the, the actual material but the premium material inside uh, electronics functional motors things like that if it bundled together could be sold for so much more mm -hmm. so i try to scale that kind of side you know the storage uh, so instead of like directly going in and uh, uh, making a cash play where like it's like just going right to the recycling center we try to make it a central ground uh, you know, uh, warehouse it, sort it, and make it into a, in a more processed environment. And that was disastrous because <laughs> it went from an easy cash play that can run from my desk at school while running full time uh, uh, classes to now like a full scale business with a lot of moving parts. Um, and that became that just like complicated and I, I bur started burning capital, right? Even though it was, it was started off a very cash flow business, it started burning more capital than I was taking in. And I, and I just shut it down. The mistake was looking back at my numbers and what I had, I could have probably sold that for six figures to another scrap metal business. Mm -hmm. I had no idea that I'm like, okay, it's no longer fun for me. I'm losing capital. Get this. I'll move on to the next thing. I just, I just, I just went on like that. So like right. looking now at like tools like micro acquire, you know, which I, I look at, I'm like, oh my God, like there's, there are university level kids who are building scrappy things, automated business, the cash flow companies, e-commerce stores selling it for like, you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands on that. So like, in that, that level of thinking, that level of resourcing was never there, mm -hmm. which was, you know, part of the times. Yeah, ab absolutely. And so what, what then led to the next venture? Uh, so I never actually, I don't have actually publicly talked about this motivation, but since you have some time here, I can talk about this. So between, so after my, after my second business failed, um, you know, I started taking, like when I graduated, uh, the dean's office said I can choose between three majors and three minors. I had three times the number of credits required, <laughs> right? So Never heard I was, that. yeah, yeah. So I just stuck around the university because I love uh, I love just learning new things and through that I was meeting people with different knowledge, right? So I would take it as a as a way to database talent, right, and for different things. So I'm like, why not just stick around here for a while and just learn and just meet new more people while I could? So I was taking like six seven courses a, a semester, but enjoying it doing it because I wanted to. And um, so I'm like, you know what? I made some good money from the, from the cash business, from the scrap metal business. So from 20, after I shut that down, uh, from like 2012, 2013, I spent a year volunteering. I worked for, um, uh, for Radhika Tissibation. She was like the first Tamil MP uh, that ran in the Scarborough River uh, area. I was her first on the ground, um, um, uh, on the ground um, uh, volunteer, health center per campaign. Um, started working at a um, at a foundation for a, uh, a women's shelter for a South Asian women's shelter to build that. Uh, it was run by a builder from um, Calgary that was trying to build something here as a, as a nonprofit. And then I was doing like a few other things, uh, just like giving away time, right? And uh, just building, uh, just you know, I just wanted to like folk, uh, wanted to like learn uh, by working for free, if you will. And um, just doing a little bunch of projects. And one of the things we ran into was um, the, in, in, in the university area, the campus, there was a, 
a medical center that shut down down the street and it was being sh it was being uh, up for sale and i got the women's shelter people um the idea that we could build a shelter there because there's two there's a college and a university there all the all those schools and it was right at the intersection between all these one of the major major bus routes so the job access was there so if we build something here it'll be a central hub and um we ended up buying that property uh, based off my recommendation turns out uh i mean this is like literally down the uh, street from the university campus right like you can see it from like uh, the student center and this place was um back in the 60s somebody bought this land dumped a bunch of industrial waste in it and on top of it built the medical center sold that and disappeared and this center has since been abandoned uh, when we bought that, the city came and set up a sign saying there's contaminated land. They, uh, you know, one of the things you have first thing to do with commercial property, you do soil testing. And it they took the budget of the project to build this women's shelter to, you know, uncontaminate the land, fix it up Jeez. and sell it back. And I'm like, this, I took it very personally, of course. But like this land was, it wasn't just polluted and that, you know, a good cause went into, uh, into fixing that where somebody else made some money, but around it was municipal housing projects. It was actually one of the most densest municipal housing projects in Scarborough, um, um, uh, Minoro Court, I believe, right? And uh, this is like thousands of, 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 ki uh, of families lived in these apartment complexes and the playground these kids all played in was like literally a playground was right behind the medical center. And it's been there for 40 years right <laughs> right so um Jeez. so all these things and the place um the one of the schools that i was volunteering at the time i was learning i was volunteering for a kids um at a, at a high school for kids with learning disability all i'll tell you josh all those kids from that area went to that special school for kids with learning disabilities they already came from bad, traditionally bad homes from uh from low economic backgrounds abusive households a lot of indigenous kids right a lot of them tested a positive for adhd and learning disabilities all these kind of uh, kind of stuff they're considered slow all that and i was doing homework help for them and i suddenly started everything's kind of kind of kind of came together like i grew up in scarborough which is a predominantly one of the most it's probably one of the most uh, uh, ethnically diverse areas on the planet it's been called that before. Almost every religion, almost every culture, almost every part, I mean, almost a population of every city is there in Scarborough. And it's one of the most under-resourced. Um, so the city of Toronto, one third of the city of Toronto is, is Scarborough. Everyone thinks of it as a borough, separate like the city of Mississauga, separate, you know, but uh, it's not part of the GTA. It's actually part of the city of Toronto. And the city itself has forgotten it. If you look at for like the CAMH building, the Center for Addiction and Mental Health, they have this pic they have a diagram of the city of Scar uh, toronto without scarborough <laughs> the entire borough one third of the city is, is completely not even there they don't even consider it that so that's how much it, like it's 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 thought of as like an afterthought it's a part of the city where it's it's considered um its own but it's not and uh you know everything from the school districts to the uh, the, the over policing it's everything everything was, was resources being sucked out of the, that borough and resourced into other areas so it seemed to me that like, you know, based off of everything that I was doing, there needs to be something done. So originally we started, I wanted to start a tech company comparable to Facebook and Twitter, where the issue was we started an advocacy group trying to promote about this. Like, look, the, all this stuff happened and we started sharing it on, on Facebook, Twitter. Mostly I did it out of my own guilt, but I realized people who are liking and engaging with it didn't even live in that area. <laughs> like there was like 3,000 residents, I think, that lived within that area that missed housing, right? Like and all those uh, um, uh, apartment building and complexes. There's no way I can go and hand out flyers to them. How can we distribute information geographically locally, right? And this is something I talked to about the NDP uh, when I was working with their, uh, with their candidate. It's something I've raised with the government. It's something I raised with uh, the university. And I started talking to people about this. Like, how can we build a tech platform where we can share information geographically? And funny enough, I went back to the university, um, you know, to, you know, find computer science people. Like, can I build an app? Can I, you know, like, can I, how do I do this? Like, I don't know Java. I don't, I don't like, what is that? What is this? This is 2013. This is just when the mobile market was just uh, booming, right? So I saw this grand opportunity to create, like, what's now, like, Yik Yak. And, like, uh, and like Snapchat has Snapchat maps now built into it. But before that, a map-based social network. We can share things by geography. And, and uh, I went and knocked on this new building that the university has built in. And in that building was something called the hub. Uh, the hub was an experiential learning center. I had no idea what that meant. But turns out it was the University of Toronto Scarborough's campus's first incubator. The, the University of Toronto has, uh, has 13, now 14 incubators accelerator. All of them are downtown and Missaga. 
This is the first one that opened the Scarborough campus, which had 12,000 of U the University of Toronto's 76,000 students in, right? So one third of the university is, uh, is about there, and it was the only uh, thing. And the day it opened was the day I came knocking. Mm -hmm. So the professor there still loves talking about the story, Greg Grafham. He just, he just uh, retired last month. But um, that became my journey into innovation. Uh, I became the first on the ground company there. Uh, launch a start, uh, technology startup with that kind of social need uh, to like yeah, help people or uh, you know share information based on geography to distribute information. Uh, and uh, hmm. there came my first tech company, which is called Mapian. Very cool. And did you end up recruiting students? Like, how did you find the first few people to work with? Did you bring on co-founders? Did you spend a little bit more time with them as opposed to the first venture before before signing them up? Yeah, I, that first venture really jaded me against co-founders. Um, you know, there were there was a few choice talent that I got exposed to, but I just kept them at arm's length because I'm like, all right, you know, let's not get married first. Let's test things out, right? And there's all that culture clash because I came from a, more of a sales business building background, and now working as an incubator, I had access to all the technology people, and technologists don't speak the same type of English that we do. <laughs> you know, words to them mean completely different things to us. So. Um, one of the great things was exposure to like actual tech companies that were forming out of there and tech organizations. Um, so I got to build a, a feel, get the feel of the language, but no, uh, unfortunately I, I tried to run it as a solo business, which as we know has a 66% more higher mortality rate than <laughs> doer businesses because you know, if one, it's all up to one founder to get everything done. And that was me. So, you know, especially trying to launch a technology company, it took me three years to figure this out. I was able to raise um, actually some angel money from a UK-based telecom. It was fascinating mm -hmm. what we wanted to do. Uh, met the, met the is, is, a, is a $3 billion company at the time. I met the founder, met the CEO at a conference, shook his hand, 60 second elevator pitch that I learned at the hub. You know, you know, two years of drilled practice from all these workshops and things like that. 60 seconds, won that, you know, the guy invited me to his penthouse, same day, wrote me a check, $30,000. Wow. Um, used that to hire some talent, uh, got this thing built out. Um, at that time, um, um, Google Maps launched an internal maps project. So you can map out buildings internally. I called the, uh, San, Fran uh, San, uh, San uh, Francisco, the Google Maps internal maps team, got a, got a hold of their beta. And this is before they launched into, into, into Canada. I'm like, hey, listen, I can map out all the universities, right? And we became an official partner with um, mm. with um, with uh, the first Canadian partner with the internal maps team to map out the university. So I took that, went to the university actually, and said, hey, I just partnered with Google. We're gonna map out all these universities. Can I make UFT first? And and I was so mind blown about this. They're like, oh, you're with the hub? Sure, because I had validation now, a check mark behind me. Right? Mm -hmm. I was some student or someone walking off the street. Um, there was this, uh, this background now, they're like, sure. And they literally gave me the AutoCAD for the entire university. And uh, we took that, got a bunch of students and actually mapped out all three, all the uh, in, in, internal structures. Got that sent to the internal maps team, work with a specialized tool that they had and got the University of Toronto mapped out. And once we did it, Ryerson's like, we gotta be on this too. Europe was like, and then they mapped themselves out. And what we ended up becoming, Mapian was the first uh, the first technology where you can share your information, like share what's going around you, not just by where you are on the map, but which floor of what building. Wow. So in the university, like, like we were taken off, right? So there were about 200 um, uh, daily active users posting about, you know, all, by room by room, what's happening in university, right? And it was, it, it, we, were, we were like, it was taken off and it was just me. I, I contracted an agency to build this thing because I couldn't find, I couldn't communicate at that time with programmers and developers uh, to build this for me. Even though I was in the computer science building, talking to developers all the time, you know, what they wanted and how to communicate with them was an interaction, ended up buy, buying an agency. And the problem with this was the agency ended up saying, uh, ended up happening, something happened. And the back end and the front end of the app, which I understand now, at the time I had no idea, disconnected based off some update went through. And the agreement with the agency was not in place where they would fix that, right? And they, they want to charge like almost half the cost of the app to come back and fix it. And I'm like, it's just, it just interlinking, just do this for me, right? Like, like we're taking off, like we're gonna give you so much credit, to, you know, for the ones helping us, uh, you know, if we succeed. You know, we have Google Maps call, uh, call me every two weeks being like, you know, when can you get the social information everywhere? And like, looking back, I'm like, we could have gotten bought out 
as a, as like a social tool to be built, integrate it into Google Maps, right? Um, and because I was on the phone every two weeks with their internal maps team. Hmm. So I'm like, let's just help me out here. And they're like, no, hmm. right? And uh, at that time I was, you know, I just proposed to my uh, now wife and girlfriend, you know, I was, I was like turning 25. I had this, uh, I had this like money draining startup. I was running for two years and a year before that I was volunteering. I just really needed you know, capital coming in. And of course, like there was like no clear path to this. I mean, like this is 2013 to 2015, right? Like the very beginning of the Toronto tech scene was starting. Nobody knew what I was doing was there. But luckily what I had was the University of Toronto. I, I was on posters, like the face of UFG entrepreneurship. I was on alumni, like magazines. Right, the university spread my message everywhere. So um, I was, I, I was like, you know what? I got all this stuff, like all these things behind me, but I, I'm in a different part of my life where I just need to get things situated. So even though like it was all good and like I just need to fix that, I'm like, I just kind of collapsed on myself. I'm like, you know what? It's time, and uh, I ended up cutting that company because I need to, I need to start a different chapter in my company. It was one of the hardest things I had to do, <laughs> and you know that's when I, the first time I actually felt like a failure. Everything else before that was like, oh man, this sucked. Whatever, I move on. But like I was in a rut. I ended up having I, I started uh, you know a nine to five job at an engineering firm. You know, as doing being the only only non engineer at an engineering firm doing sales. <laughs> you know, got like the most grittiest like nine to five you can possibly imagine with like a consistent paycheck just to get get past that curve. But during that time, I'm just like, you know, I thought it was it until I got the call from Greg Grafham from the university. And they're like, listen, Rav, like, um, you know, your, you know, your journey has been one of the most inspirational. We've done all this marketing for you. Um, we, I know, you know, you're going to keep being entrepreneurial. Why don't you do that within the university uh, environment and uh, come in as an entrepreneur in residence? You know, I never heard this term before. It's like, you can still, you can, you know, come work with us, provide programming, you know, uh, we'll provide funding where we can, uh, in return, you get access to university resources and their next company, uh, can be started right, uh, right from here as right? hmm. well. And I was like, I never had anyone do that for me, you know, to pull me to like, there's every resource in my life, my friends, family, like, what are you doing? I think it's so risky. Like, I don't know what to say you do. Like, it was like kind of like my fault. It's like, I have no idea to tell people what you do when they ask me. Right. And, um, and so I was like, you know, uh, the first time in my life, I was kind of stable, had like this, like $60,000 job, you know, and like the company was talking about two year, five year goal paths. And I'm like, what? you know, and I'm like the stability of the stability. Right. And, uh, and I'm like, you know what, it's, I need to do this. Right. So I joined the university as there. And when I joined the new Ford government came into power and froze all innovation funding. Jeez. So, um, I got zero capital coming in, but I had the university of Toronto saying like, I think I did one workshop before funding a cut and they paid me like $500 to do a one hour talk, right. Uh, to about, you know, lean startup and, and build up. And I started realizing, I'm like, you know, if university of Toronto paid me $500 for an hour, can other people do this for me as well? Right. And that's became my consulting background, right? Degree. So started working at the university as like a, um, entrepreneur in res, uh, almost basically volunteering because there's no funding for like, you know, uh, for, for that period. Uh, and then, you know, running workshops, you know, just doing one-on-ones with companies. I started running like panel discussions. It became like an inventing ground for myself to build like media mm -hmm. uh, and like, not just media, but like just content without the cameras, you know, uh, you know, just having conversations, you know, uh, learning, um, and, and just pr providing into a community. And, uh, through that, I started realizing, you know, I started, you know, loving the idea of working on other companies as a third party. Cause I'm like, I can look at this from an operational lens. I'm like, this, I can operate in a way that I wish others operated for me. Like, cause like I never had like, a good mentor from the business side until like I got into the university uh, incubator, et cetera, environment and like started getting paired with people. So I'm like, you know what, if I can be this for other people, you know, like maybe I can prevent them from going through what I did mistakes that I have. So I started doing that for companies, learning about that. And what, one of the time, one of the things that came back to is that one of the benefits I had was all this media attention that the university gave. But by 2015, 2016, 2017, when I was running this for 2017, was like there was a kind of Toronto succeed as maturing, and everyone was like you know in the innovation industry. It seemed like 2017 or 2019. I don't know if you remember. It was this wild time in Toronto where like this conservative banking city 
was suddenly flush with all these startups. A lot of them are moving in from the States. A lot of them were like, um, you know, professionals that worked in like European companies, uh, Asian companies, coming back to Canada with all this capital and like launching technology companies because machine learning was invented here. All these AI engineers were available in, in Waterloo and all these actions that are happening, right? So I'm like, let's take this externally. So started doing talks, started doing speeches. Um, started, you know, uh, you know, a lot of them were, I, I, could, I could probably say I'm entrepreneur residents at the University of Toronto, you know, <laughs> even though I was not making any income from there, like having that title is open doors. Um, so through that time, I'm like, you know, I'm really enjoying this process of getting to know people and finding stories, providing a support. Um, you know, how can I do that in a, in a, in a substantial way, right? Um, and that's when the podcast was born. Um, so one of the concerning things I kept hearing was that people loved the storytelling that I did. They loved hearing about other companies. Uh, they, help, they loved the idea that I was interacting and, and like, you know, you should meet this person, you should meet that person. So, uh, but one of the things that is constantly missing was media. All these companies know media, right? I know, I know companies that are going to radio stations like, yo, can you cover us? We have this update. And radio stations like, what? what? What's a startup? Yeah. <laughs> Who are you, right? Um, so like, I'll, like, I'm like, they're going to like the traditional, the traditional media. So I'm like, let's start a podcast. I partnered with like a, a movie producer. Um, uh, you know, he, he his aspirations to build Netflix style movies. He did like. He did like uh, music videos and huge production environments. And we're like, you know, let's not make a podcast, let's make a produced environment. Let's make startups cool, right? So we literally at the university built this portable set with like these, uh, with these blue and purple lights. It looks like a, like a, like a, like a, like a music, like a, like a music video shoot uh, with all these lights and cameras. We had three 4K cameras, uh, like a dedicated video, video, uh, videographer that uh, shoots, uh, shoots actual content there. We had like an actual like a audio technician there that like is like three sources of audio, like engineering it on li like in live. It was a crazy setup that we built out. And um, the idea was to build a portable center that we can go from incubator to incubator. And what we'll do is for, for startups for free, create one hour long form, like 4K high quality audio videos that they can use for whatever reason. So it's like something we did for you. So it was never like, let's build a Joe Rogan style podcast with you know, millions of users. No, it's like, we're gonna create this podcast, we're gonna, pr we're gonna, pr we're gonna, we're gonna uh, produce it, but, but the marketing is for you, collateral is for you. It's like, this video is for you. You take this and share, share, share your uh, opportunity. And our first 10 episodes was, um, uh, uh, was phenomenal hit. I think like episode seven was our first testimonial, Michael Cronin, Michael, uh, number eight, Michael Cronin, he came with a choir agency, 24 year old, Right, um, you know, helped build, help got his, his previous startup got acquired by Groupon, um, you know, uh, and was a senior director at, by like 19 at Groupon. Right, <laughs> he did that for like two years, and um, at 24 he started launch his agency, and he came on and talked about for the first time his story of how he grew up poor in Alabama, lived in the street in, in, in like in like in like Chicago, came to Queens Uni University, dropped out first year, and ended up sleeping on the couch of Michelle Romanoff. Jeez. And, Became part, became the op, uh, became so, became everything from her assistant to her, um, uh, to her COO of her first startup, which got acquired by Groupon, right? And um, th and like that story curve, turns out the uh, one uh, there's a, a company that he was prospecting, a million dollar client, right? Um, that uh, he's been talking to, and to check up on him, they of course Googled him, and our episode had like what three hundred views. Like if, if that at then, right? Like I think at that time, like 46 views, it was like super new. And uh, one of those views was like the senior director at that company who was prospecting, who saw the story, fell in love with it. And it's like, you know what? You're new, like you're a kid, but I love your story. I love to work with you. And handed him $50,000 a month, right? Mm -hmm. And that kickstarted his agency. Now, now like a fire agency, you know, is like 14 people, uh, you know, multi-million dollars in, in, a year in clients grown huge um, and, and we're in contact a lot, but that was like our first like, oh my God, like these, these, you know, like sharing these stories of why people start these things, what their motivation is a huge testament. I've had founders come back and tell me they've had their, you know, they hired their first people who left their high paying, like, you know, um, senior jobs to come work with them because we're inspired by what they said. Uh, we had VCs and angels say that we gave money to people uh, because of the stories we heard, because we were able to, you know, uh, for the first time, see them vulnerable. And like, mm -hmm. you know, we can watch it uh, at our own time. So we start seeing it's like, you know, forget the numbers, forget the audience. This is like something, a gift we can give the community. And uh, and inadvertently, it turned into relationships. 
a lot of these companies end up hiring us. Um, so we, we, we launched like a part, uh, a, a, um, a, uh, parallel agency, uh, sales as a service, helping startups with sales. Um, you know, so companies that came through the podcast, we become friends with, and we ended up, you know, helping them with sales that helped uh, fuel us and, um, started building this over two and a half years. COVID of course, threw a wrench in it, our entire beautiful set, which I miss <laughs> every day, completely useless and sitting in my basement. Uh, but you know, after some trial and error, we kind of flipped over to a virtual environment and, uh, here we are, we, we built this beautiful engine, uh, system that can automate uh, virtual pro our podcast production. Um, you know, we have AI that can like come in and, um, take waveform analysis, isolate your voice and make you sound really isolated and really good. Level your voice with your partner uh, do like a little bit of auto tune. So your tonality sounds really nice. Um, s slow you down. If you talk too fast, all these kind of things, right? So we can do like, uh, you know, the stuff that I've done, for, we, we, you know, we, you know, we sort of a self need. We built this engine for me to you know, streamline editing because um, it's only me and my co-founder at that time who, who were running this together. And we now started applying for other creators. So we help uh, other startups with performance management. It's something we kind of, again, like the, all other companies we kind of fell into as a need. Everything has been inbound. People asking us like, hey, how have you been doing this? Like, you know, because we've done 171 episodes now. And, and this, this being your 113th, you can see like how much work goes behind the scenes. Like, like, and I, I see from you, like, you know, you, uh, how you told me about how much, like, the reason you do this is like, you just like having the conversation. Like, it's something you enjoy. Mm -hmm. And it's one of the reasons why uh, you are here what you hear. But a lot of people starting off, they don't have that kind of mentality. A lot of creators are like, I need to create content. Gary V is yelling at me to create 100 pieces of content a day. How do I do this? Right? And it, like, they get caught up in this anxiety of these things. So, um, you know, just kind of sort of like all my other companies, talent management is like, hey, like, we can, we can help manage it for you, right? You focus on what you want to build, being created, run the, run the content. Let me, let us as a team and with our system, manage all the underlying factors, scheduling, production, distribution, and then coaching and feedback. You know, we have coaches that work with us now. Uh, and the idea is to like, you know, just like we've inspired startups to like, um, you know, create content, we want to turn founders into their own podcasters. So for the first time, Founders can easily and efficiently launch their own media channels and, you know, be in control of their own storytelling uh, and talk as, as in detail or as much as they want, but why they're doing what they're doing, who they're talking to, who they have access to, right? So uh, I b firmly believe in like the build in public movement. If more founders talk openly about their problems and, uh, and talk openly about what they're building, solutions will come to you. And, mm -hmm. and, being, and, and I hope you can agree, like being in a podcasting, I've seen this time and time again, companies that come on and are shocked. It's like, you know, just because I talked about this, you know, I finally had an opportunity through your podcast. I know I got inspired by your podcast, so I did three more. Uh, just because I talked about this, people have heard about it and coming into it. And I think, uh, and again, I, I think I'm, I might be over explaining your question here, but coming back into this, like where we're heading. Um, I think we're heading into a really interesting media environment. I know, and, I'm, and I know we're close to time here, but I, I love to end this here or, or get close to ending here. We're heading this really interesting environment in media and technology, right? Like Web 3.0, you know, everyone hails it as like, you know, as like the first dot com, like overhyped, but yet like poorly understood. Um, ultimately, I think it's going to be, you know, under um, data, uh, how data is transferred, right? So. Just like uh, previously, um, media was transferred efficiently to the internet. Um, data is more importantly being transferred really quickly. And on top of this data, like we have these algorithms who are making decisions on behalf of people. So Web 3.0 is, is the first time we're going to have a machine to machine economy where machines are going to interact with each other and make decisions on our behalf. And we're going to be guided almost as a society, uh, as communities towards making certain actions and content creators are are, are 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 like the first and foremost above this right so like if you're creating content in any platform you're completely at the mercy of the at the at the, at the, at the algorithm which is breaking you down by a recommender engine and recommending who sees what right so mm. every every media distribution platform now has become uh, has been um fabricated by a recommender engines who recommends who sees what and i think we're switching from a media environment where the goal is to get thousands of impressions to finding your tribe. Web 3.0 is going to be run on sub-communities and sub-economies. Um, so this idea of a thousand true fans, right? Or a hundred mm -hmm. true fans, you know, a thousand people pay you a hundred dollars a month, that's a hundred thousand dollars, right? So that's being the, the first curve you can break out and create um, sub-businesses. So 
people like Naval Ravikant from like Angel List has talked about there's like a billion billion like like a billion uh, uh, like uh, uh, there's a billion different um, um, uh, million dollar companies that are potentially mm. made by the new age of the internet. There's all these new opportunities that, that's made possible. So I think like what's really happening is this semblance of, of a new type of, uh, um, of expansion in, in our economy, right? Mediated by this machine to machine environment, um, where like you don't have to monetize them for millions of people. You can monetize them at two thousand. So all these sub communities and micro communities going to appear, where like thought leaders and um, you know media creators and facilitators can really service a very very niche kind of communities. Um, and um, so I, I see like the semblance of how the creator economy is going to evolve to that from the influencer economy to the creator economy, how creators can function is based off of micro communities and impact versus just impression. Um, so uh, I think as we evolve into this Web3 kind of environment, it's going to open the door for how you know, Ready Player One stuff, how metaverses, the, the true metaverse doesn't have to be virtual reality or all these fancy inputs. It's really people figuring out how to work together over virtual distances, right? And Absolutely. Uh, COVID has brought this on us. Like the last two years, we have seen this radical transformation, and I, I'm excited to see what the next five years of de development in this space is going to be look like. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, a lot of great stuff in, in there, Ravi, and I, I can certainly relate to the point you made about founders uh, basically becoming from the way I've kind of seen it and interpreted it is founders becoming part of their company brand, right? So you no longer need per se a company brand. You mm. probably do and, and it gets created by extension anyways, but you can have your co-founder, your CEO, your CTO, whoever, be building their own brand as an extension of the company to be a really strong marketing and sales tactic uh, for the company as well. Is, is this something that you see? Like, I mean, I'm assuming yes, because that's kind of what you're in the business of, right? Help helping, helping startups and, and other different types of entrepreneurs create content. But is that another way? Am I seeing that right? Absolutely. So I think we're going to see more cults of personality um, where the founder mm. reigns supreme over the startup, right? So before it was like, like you mentioned, more startup branding, like, you know, Lever or Lyft or Uber, like these like you know, household names. Uh, but I, I think it's no more about like household uh, people, right? So like, for mm -hmm. example, Gary Vee, I think he has like a forty billion dollar, um, uh, um, uh, what is it, uh, marketing agency that he has built, right? Um, um, right. So uh, I forgot what it's called right now. I'm blanking on this, but uh, but um, VaynerMedia. Right? So, VaynerMedia, yeah, yeah, right. Like he has done this huge thing, but like, you know, he, but he has like five, fifteen other businesses, bunch of investments, all these kind of things. So in Web 2.0, we saw these cults of personalities where these people. You know, got millions of users, like millions of listeners, like Joe Rogan, uh, Scott Galloway, right? And uh, use their authenticity to create startup, utilize their brand to create companies. I think Web 3.0 is going to bring this to the masses, right? So you don't need millions of impressions that people know. You just need a few thousand uh, to really believe in and 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 like uh, you know, inspire you, see you as a, as a leader personality or like aspire, you know, subscribe to your thought leadership, and you can create parallel companies or agencies based off of that business around them. So right. um, I think monetization is going to go from an ad centric model of impressions over millions towards impact models where, you know, you get, you find your true, uh, true, uh, true fans, uh, inspire a cult of personality and utilize that support, that banner, that not just brand, but trust. Ultimately, I think we're in a crisis of trust. Um, the, the CEO of Salesforce talked about that at uh, uh, Dreamforce, right? We are in a crisis of trust. And hmm. that's, I think, that's what's really inspiring this. So people are looking for people to trust in, not brands, not companies, because companies and governments have, uh, have the last two decades supremely disappointed us. Right. Um, so they're looking for people, looking for leadership, right? And not looking for that uh, that all-father uh, Fuhrer figure to run over uh, in, entire countries, but just run over our, our level of thinking, uh, in our right. level of business, and our level of lifestyle, um, in our in our language, um, so I think there's all these different vectors of how people can uh, be, uh, can can become more leaders. So um, yeah, so I think the creator economy is fueled by the by the need for trust and leadership. Absolutely, it's a great way to put it, Ravi. My my last question that I love to ask every guest is: if you were talking to somebody who's maybe younger, early in their earlier in their career, or they're working a nine to five, they're not happy. They know there's something more out there. 
they've thought about entrepreneurship maybe a little bit. What's one or two pieces of advice you would give to them to get started? Uh, create media. Um, I think uh, everyone talks about this as a bad thing, but um, uh, I think like um, it was high schoolers who, were, who talked about, you know, what's the main thing that you want to be when you grow up? And they say a famous YouTuber. And everyone mm -hmm. groans, it's like, oh, that's terrible. But they don't understand what that means, right? What they're really talking about is, is creating their own points of distribution, of, of, of building of, of one, one um, speaking things in existence, right? Like um, if, if opportunities can come to you, why not, right? So by con creating content, you can bring things uh, to you. You can prove uh, your capabilities of what you can do, of what you know, et cetera. So I think the main thing is, uh, it used, you know, is to start talking about what you care about, what you love, you know, all, all those kind of things. Start building a tribe because it's free. You know, you can just mm -hmm. pull up your TikTok and start doing that right now. It doesn't have to be great. It just has to be, it has to be done. Um, so start creating content as a way to like, you know, uh, for the algorithm to understand you, for different algorithms to understand you and start connecting you to resources, right? So how to get machines to do work for you is media. So get these recommender systems understanding how you create media, what you care about, what you talk about, and help them find, uh, and they will find your tribe for you. And then that be, that being the most efficient thing you can do. And the second thing is um, learn to create your own own um, own activity. So we're moving into the knowledge economy. Part of the knowledge economy is entrepreneurship, right? So being it's going to go lean heavier on the top twenty percent of of the of the population that creates eighty percent of the wealth, and we're going to see this huge income disparity that's going to get worse. Uh, we're moving into into a place of um, uh, into an economy of creators for creators. So, if you don't create, um, you're being left behind. And two the, the two gifts the internet has given us is uh, two forms of permissionless leverage: media and code. Um, if don't, you don't have to learn to code, but learn to leverage code. No code and, and uh, low code. So, yeah, leveraging code, leveraging media. Uh, I would say it to everyone. Awesome. Ravi, this has been great. Thank you very much for coming on the show and sharing your story. If anybody wants to get in touch or learn more, where do you recommend that they go? Uh, uh, LinkedIn being the primary place, right? Uh, Ravi Ravindran, you can find me there. Um, just a, a Google search, uh, we'll find the, the podcast. Uh, my, po my personal podcast is called the Disrupt Podcast. Uh, the company is called Bluemex. Uh, you can find all the podcasts we manage there. They're all in the innovation space, uh, talking to entrepreneurs, uh, founders, uh, and enablers and investors in the region, uh, in the space. And second thing, if uh, you do want to follow a personal journey, don't know why, if you do, um, you can find me on um, Instagram as well at Ravi underscore Ravindran. Awesome. We will include links to all those in the description below. Ravi, thanks again for coming on the show. Really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me, Josh. Appreciate it.